Ok. Get the next I thought I would share some early reflections on a kind of controversial issue that has emerged in the last couple of days here regionally in southern Alberta. And this has to do with a new public art installation that was commissioned by the city of Calgary from an artisan in New York who claims that the piece is Blackfoot inspired. And the criticism over this new installation comes from at least a couple of different political fronts, but let's take a look at the piece itself. All right, here's what it looks like. It's basically scaffolding holding rocks. There are four different scaffold towers, each of which has three vertical spikes and six horizontal pieces of scaffolding holding up uh, large chunks of rundle rock. Now rundle rock is a, uh, a kind of a rock that is used in landscaping a lot and it's quarried here in, in Alberta. It's the only place where it's quarried, uh, Mount Rundle, hence the name Rundle Rock. And it comes from a bed, a seabed that's 200, close to 250,000 years old ancient seabed. Very, very fine silt settling to create this rock. And on the surface of the rock you can sometimes see ripple marks from that old seabed um, as well as fossils. So this is a famous local rock and yeah um, it's being held in scaffolding like this. So there's a, f a few different issues with this, right? The, the, the artisan is, his name is Del Geist. And we haven't really heard from him in the media here. All we're hearing is from um, local media figures, politicians, and, you know, your average Joe Blow that has an opinion about this. And those opinions vary depending on your position in society. For instance, um, I've seen a lot of people say online that this just looks like a heap of junk that, um, you know, like the remains of maybe a burned down building that you'd want to pay to have your city get rid of <laughs> rather than um, install, right? So this is opinions from one, one side of a fence. Um, there's another side of a fence, for sure, who look at this piece and ask, well, how is it Blackfoot inspired? Because that's what the media is saying. Now, we haven't actually heard the artist come out and tell us this, you know, in any kind of video or anything like that. It just is coming from the, the city and the media right now. Um... But we're told that, you know, it's meant to be a, a tribute, a Blackfoot tribute in some ways. Um, asked how, the city uh, seems to be saying that since there are four of these kind of scaffoldings, pieces, the vertical towers, four of them, that four is representative of the four seasons and you know the four ages and the four directions and the four whatever some medicine wheel garbage stuff that isn't even blackfoot to begin with um a lot of blackfoot people have seen this image and what it evoked for them was something more like this that perhaps what the artist is trying to create 
or recreate or, or evoke in some manner are the old scaffoldings for, for tree burials, um, for what do they call them, sky burials. In English, that's a lot of times what they're called. But this is the Blackfoot funerary practice of leaving the body um, out in the trees by the river to go back to the source, right? So when, when the word comes out that this is Blackfoot inspired and Blackfoot people see this, of course, that's the first thing that kind of comes to mind is it looks like, kind of like the funerary scaffolding, except maybe more like a Sioux style because there's no trees involved. <laughs> but, uh, and then the question becomes like, why would the artist want to portray scaffolding? And then, you know, you inevitably are going to get the next guy saying, well, it's because they consider us all to be dead and... Um, and then there's the, you know, if it is, if there was some intentionality of the cities to have the peace be a tribute to Blackfoot communities, why was there no community consultation with Blackfoot people? Why was a Blackfoot artist not employed? or Blackfoot artists to come up with whatever was going to happen. Um, on another side of the fence, there's the issue of money. The city has spent half a million dollars on this installation. The money went to an artisan in New York when we have many, many regional artisans, artists that would have loved to have that contract. In the media, the response to that criticism has been that the support for local artists <laughs> is there uh, because the city is trying to support, um, you know, wide competition for artists and they want the artisans of Calgary and area to be able to participate in that broader market as well. <laughs> it's a really political answer, that one. It's ridiculous. I mean, of all the criticisms being waged against this uh, this installation, the money one, not staying local, is the pretty much the only one I, I strongly agree with. Um, there's other things cropping up like, you know, if it, it, this is meant to be black for anything, is it cultural appropriation? If this is indeed meant to be something like the funerary scaffolding, isn't that, you know, kind of sacrilegious? Isn't that kind of, what would you call it? I don't know if someone was going to honor your culture and they went to your cemetery and just took a picture of the cemetery or, or, or recreated a, a scene to look like a cemetery on the side of the highway to say this is your culture, how would you take that? <clears throat> All the same, I'm not so in on the critical perspectives on it. Uh, because I think that's all, you know, it's all fine and great, like the ones that have been raised so far. Um, and they're all valid points. You know, why is the city spending so much money on this and that money is leaving? Um, did it even need to be spent on art? And if it did, did it need to leave the region, that money? Um, why weren't Blackfoot artists employed if it was supposed to be a tribute to Blackfoot in, in the era of, of truth and reconciliation? Um why wasn't there at least community consultation if it was supposed to have anything to do with Blackfoot communities? Like I said, we, we just haven't even heard from the artist. But in any case, um, I agree. When I look at this, I see funerary scaffolding. But to me, I don't think that's such a bad thing. In fact, 
Um, I think this art installation, if it's not purposefully meant to represent funerary scaffolding, might inadvertently actually <laughs> um, have much more potential than perhaps the, the artist originally planned. I don't know, you know. Um, I can't say at all what was planned. We haven't heard from Dell, right? But to me, it does look like the funerary scaffolding. And so to me, that brings up an opportunity to raise awareness of uh, and discussion about at least two, but many, potentially many more important Blackfoot concepts, values, practices. Like, for instance, Atsimskatsen. Um, Atsimskatsen is the active um, correlation to Atsimoitskan. Atsimoitskan is what people mostly would translate as, into English as prayer, but when you really break down the word, uh, it seems to more be referring to reciprocation by voice, meaning giving gratitude, expressing gratitude, rather than the word prayer in English, which has a lot of baggage to it. Atsimskatsen is the act, another active part on that, rather than reciprocating via voice, you're reciprocating via some other kind of action, giving back. You know, when I went to uh, train in climate science with the late Narcissus Blood, we listened to a whole day of lectures about how to respond to climate science. And it, we walked away, went to go have dinner, and Narcissus commented that, you know, the one thing that they really don't get at all yet is Atsimskas. And all of their models are just still, all of their solutions are still take less models. Reduce, reuse, recycle, carbon capture, what have you. It's taking less. There is no, no consideration at all yet for giving back. And there is no giving back of anything right, in the mainstream culture. Not even your waste, right, not even human waste, <laughs> certainly not the bodies. This image, by the way, is an image of an old, old um, Okan. Um, I was there that year when this Okan was built by the late uh, Stella Tallman and the late Okan Hungry Wolf. And this is a kind of an offering, a Blackfoot uh, offering of a sort. Okay. Atsimp Scott's in the giving. See the bundle of Saskatoon, the hundred Saskatoon plants that could have fed people berries that bring long life are given up as part of this offering, as well as many, many other things here. Teepee poles. Firewoods. Many rare and precious things wrapped around the pole. All a kind of a giving, hey, us, uh, you know, not only symbolic but real, but also meant to um, train that kind of thinking. Hey, so this is one concept that I think could be explored by the new art piece. Another one is uh, it gets stuck and very closely related, which is some people would translate as offering, to make an offering, right? Here we have tree burials again, but I could have used other other things, but it gets stuck in my, my own kind of understanding what I've developed so far. I'm not saying that everyone would agree with me is that um, it, is a, it is a giving back of what you're done using, right? So when you say the word offering in English, it, it really crosses both realms of Atsimskas and, and it gets stuck in. It gets stuck in one of a, a prototype might be like a shedding of your skin or you cut, cut off your hair. 
you know, and you give that back. You know, the late uh, Frank Weaselhead used to say that our bodies, nothing belongs to us, not the shirt on our back and not even our bodies. You know, when my shirt wears out, gets a hole, something tears, I'll go out and leave it as an offering back, you know, into life. That's a kid stuck in. And then I have the right to pick up a new shirt. The same is the Blackfoot tradition with the body. Right? It gets stuck in. And really, I think that this is a discussion that needs to be brought forward. A discussion around funerary practices. Because one of the things that I see in the Blackfoot community is that um, funerary practices, you know, are just as inflexible there as anywhere else. They're really wrapped up in the Christian tradition, the idea of taking the body and preparing it for a resurrection, trying to keep it in its static state. It's just when it, just when that person passed away. So there's all kinds of measures taken to preserve the body, right? And, you know, it, it bothers me a lot that when I pass away, probably my body's going to be all violated by medical and funerary professionals, so to speak. And part of my body's going to be incinerated because it's considered a biotoxin. And the other part of my body is going to be treated with weird chemicals so that it can be entombed and can await a resurrection in a tradition that to me is, seems completely abiotic <laughs> and attacking the life of this planet. And so um, to me, this, is a, this, this installment actually has, carries a lot of potential whether the art artist intended it or not, and I think that he probably did, but I'm waiting to actually, you know, hear something from him in the media. But either way, it, carry, it carries a lot of potential to bring about that kind of um, discussion, you know. And the reality is that a lot of the ontological thought, even in the Blackfoot community, has been shifted uh, hugely by the colonial experience. You know, the very first cash crop on the prairies for the settlers was to collect the bones on their on their acreages. You know, or whatever you'd call those, those sections of land that they were given. Right? Collect up all the human bones, all the bones of the recently exterminated bison and float them down the Missouri River back east to St. Louis or where have you, where they're processed into fertilizer, which would then be returned upstream and um, become part of the process of bringing industrialized agriculture um, into, into reality, right? <clears throat> So, and when you remove this kind of a scene from the landscape, I think it does something. Um, because I think this is always a reminder, especially when you know the people. You know, when you travel the landscape, and that landscape is, there's the people who you knew, where they are, and what remains, you know. And they're returning back into the life system. Um, it, it speaks to a different way of engagement with uh, the ecology and a different understanding of, the, of what's going on completely, like cosmologically. What's, what's, what are we doing here, right? It's a different tradition. So if, if this can in any way evoke some of that, 
discussion, I think it's well worth the, the half a million dollars, in my opinion, because I think that discussion needs to be had. Saw another image, and by the way, like these images are stolen images. These aren't my images. This one is. I took this photograph, but obviously, well, this this one old, and these ones. These are this is an old uh, Walter McClintock image, I think. An old uh, lamp slide image from maybe 1870. No, I must be wrong about that. 1890? <laughs> Probably 1907. Anyway, a while ago. Um, I saw a more recent picture of the installment from a little bit of a different perspective. This is just back a little bit ways. And this game brought another thing to mind because to see it enwrapped in the road works in this way, um, well, it, it just reminded me of all the deaths that come from our roadways. And this is one of the, this is probably the premier killer of, I don't know, I, I, I don't know, but it's up there, whether it's the premier or, or close. Um, it's one of the one of the top end killers of human beings and definitely other wildlife, other other life on this planet <clears throat> are our, our, our uh, automotives, right? In fact, some of my very good friends have, you know, are not here, really uh, wise people who their life ended just because basically they were hit by a car. And uh, so me, to me, this, this brings about another potential level of signification that may or may not have been intended by the artist. You know, I doubt it um, at this point. But, but um, to me, this is another important discussion. Like, why is it okay that we're killing people in other life on our roads as frequently as we are? Um, I, and I do have a kind of a hypothetical answer to that. And I think that this is really, here's my hypothesis, that the lives that we allow to be taken every year through automobiles, because we certainly aren't saying, hey, let's, let's wait a minute. This is killing a lot of people. We've got to take a step back and uh, reconfigure. We're just, we're just going at it. We're just continuing to go at it, trying to keep it safe, but we're going at it and people are still dying every day all over the place. And um, so my hypothesis is that this is one of our offerings, uh, part of our Otsimpskats and our modern day Otsimpskats, and, and that's why we allow it, that it, we, we recognize that for the life that we want to live, this sacrifice is necessary. You know who else used to think like that? I, b I believe uh, the Aztecs. You know the on the, on the pyramids in uh, Tenochtitlan. They used to have human sacrifices, and they talked about the thousands that they were sacrificing. I believe that the Aztecs at that time understood that the price that they would have to pay for urbanization of the level that even they were gaining was uh, a price that would come in human lives. And so they engaged in that directly and consciously. Whereas we kind of engage in it in a weird... Um, distanced way and maybe we can fantasize and blame things about you know things about how it was somebody's time or these kind of things but really you know we're okay with the sacrifice aren't we for uh, for what we're doing so if we're okay with that 
you know, why do we then take those people too and either entomb them or greedily uh, cremate their remains, burn away the uh, most of the energy that's in them? <laughs> There's all kinds of interesting conversation, I think, that can come from this installation. And if you go to um, Del Geist's website, you can see that this kind of, these kind of installations, rocks on large rocks um, up on scaffolding, it's nothing new. This is really, a, this actually is a very signature piece for Del Geist, looking at his body of work. You should, if you knew Del Geist and you hadn't seen this piece and you, drew, and you drove past it, you would say, huh, that looks like his stuff, if you knew his stuff, right? So it's, that brings out something interesting about it too, which is, you know, the way that art can just evoke us, like it brings us to, um, to wrap all of our own issues and stuff up in it, right? <laughs> That's the best thing about it. And by being controversial in a way, this this um, piece is already very much a success. But I do, you know, I do also feel for, <laughs> I'm sure the artist would love to be a, this to be a, a success on somewhat different terms than having the negative publicity. Any case, um, that's my kind of take on the, on what's going on there. Uh, the little local controversy, my early reflections, because I really don't know a whole lot about this yet. And like I said, haven't heard from the artist, but some of the things that uh, I thought about in light of this. And uh, I know that whatever happens to this, this installation, I'm going to be hanging on to some photographs of it um, so I can talk about some of these issues, concepts, ideas and stuff, practices. Um, in future presentations.